All right. Hey guys, um, I'm Shruti Kapoor. I'm a software engineer at PayPal uh, in San Jose, California. And today I'm going to be talking about GraphQL and state management. Um, at PayPal, we work with three technologies, most often GraphQL, React, and JavaScript. And I'm super passionate about these three technologies. But more than that, I'm passionate about dev jokes. <laughs> so how do you comfort a JavaScript bug? Not you, Tane. <laughs> you console it. How do programmers cheer? Hey, <laughs> pare. Okay. Why couldn't the React component understand the joke? Maybe. I think somebody said it. It didn't get the context. <laughs> okay, if you want to read more dev jokes, go to my GitHub at Shruti Kapoor 08. <laughs> I put it there. All right, let's get started. So I'm going to be talking about GraphQL and state management. My goal to today is to let you think in terms of data, help you understand how do hooks GraphQL and state management come into action and help you draw the link between these three technologies. I want to give you enough information so that when you go back, you can go and experiment with hooks and GraphQL on your own. So here are the things we're going to be talking about. I'll talk about the different types of state, how things are different when we have a GraphQL API versus a REST API, state management and how to think about it, how to use hooks to manage state, and what are the decisions you can use to think about which state management you should use. So let's first talk about the different types of state. In a typical web application, we'll have a global state or a local state. Um, global state is a state that exists in the entire application, as the name suggests. Uh, something like a user logs in. You want every component to know that a user has logged in and maybe display a welcome message, display their list of uh, transactions, things like that. And local state is state that is um, within a component. So let's say you have a form. Somebody clicked on an element. You want to show like a hover field or you want to show a text message or you want to show a help text. That is the local state of that component. It's not very black and white. There's also things that are between the two. So there might be a state, there might be a component that has global local state. Um, let's look at a web application. So this is the dashboard that you'll see when you log into PayPal. Um, typical web application, there's a form, there's a list of users, there's an authorization. So there would be a form which interacts with, uh, uh, which, uh, intera which the user interacts, puts in their name, and then you might want to display a list of the users. And then if the user is logged in, we want to display this form, otherwise we want to display a generic screen. So there is a lot of global and local state going on here. Let's look at it in action. So the authorization is global state. Once the user logs in, we want all the components to know and have access to this data object. Something like a form might be a local state. Things that happen within the form might be a local state. And something like a list might be a local or global state, depending on how you want to use it in your application. So the state changes in an application in three different ways. Um, an application mounts. The life cycle of the application changes. Or a component mounted. And you want to change your state based on the component. The component could have called an API. Or a user interacts with the form, enters some data. You want to send that data over to the application. So your state changes in a lot of different ways. These are three common ones. Why do we need to manage the state? The thing is that the data already exists in the application, whether you manage it or not. And data changes all the time. You want your components to know what data has changed and have access to that data. And you need a place to store all of that data in one single place where all components can talk to. So that's why we need to manage the state. Now let's look at how GraphQL changes things. How many of you have used GraphQL? Awesome, a lot of you. So for those of you who are not aware of what GraphQL is, I'll give a quick 101. 
GraphQL is really popular these days. As you can see, it's used by 153,000 people. Um, it's used by a lot of the big companies as well, like Facebook, PayPal, Intuit, Twitter, Pay uh, Coursera. But what really is GraphQL? GraphQL is basically a query language for APIs. It's a way of defining how to fetch information. Um, some people confuse GraphQL with SQL, but it's not a query language for database. It's a query language for how to talk to an API. It's, uh, it uses type system to ask for data, and it's strongly typed. So in the documentation of GraphQL, it says that GraphQL is a query language for APIs and a runtime for fulfilling those queries with your existing data. GraphQL provides a complete and understandable description of the data in your API and gives clients the power to ask for exactly what they need and nothing more. But I think the most important statement here for a UI developer is the idea that it gives clients the power to ask for exactly what they need and nothing more. Let me show you how things are different with GraphQL. The first idea is that because we are only asking for the data we need, we actually have reduced data. So we have the need of managing state less. That means that we have less data to manage on the client side, so our state management solution doesn't need to be that complex. Let me show you a typical UI. This is the Google Play Music API, uh, Google Play Music app, um, application. So um, let's say we have this UI. Let's say it uses a REST API. Um, and what we want to do here is show the list of albums of a specific user. So the API endpoint we are interested in is slash albums. We want to show the name of the artist, the name of the song or the album, um, the artwork, which is the image that you're seeing here. So what we'll have to do is, when we call slash albums, it in turn calls a few different APIs, which, is, which might be like slash songs, artists, artwork, which all take their own time to load and get back data. So once they send back data to you, the album's API dissolves. But what happens behind the hood is, songs, artists, and artwork all send back their objects, and then albums get this giant object. So what you asked for was four different fields, but what you got back was lots of data. Now how does fetching data look with GraphQL? Let's take a look. So let's say, again, you have a slash albums endpoint, but this time it's a GraphQL endpoint. Let's see how things are different with GraphQL. So now you have a slash albums endpoint. You do a query, so you're going to call albums, and then you're going to have date, artwork, and within that query itself, you can call songs. So now you'll have name, ID, actor, or the artist, and the lyrics. So within one single query, you're asking for all the information that you need. Once that resolves, it gives you back an object, and albums resolves immediately. So what you were expecting was a lot of data, but what you got was small data. So basically, with GraphQL, you already have less data to manage on the client side because it gives clients the power to ask for exactly what they need and nothing more. The second biggest advantage that GraphQL has for state management is that most of the heavy lifting is done on the server. So we noticed that in our applications, one of the biggest work that Redux, which was a state management solution we used, was filtering users for user ID. And it could be anything for you. So you could be filtering anything on, this, on the React style. So what we noticed that UI developer were doing a lot of filtering using Redux, using one of the middlewares, or just doing it on the client side. So what we did with GraphQL was remove it from the UI developer side to the API developer side. And the API developer would give back filtered users, filtered data for you. And they did that with the help of resolvers. So with resolvers, we can actually put most of the heavy lifting on the server, and hence doing server offloading. And we do that by passing in the ID of the user that we need right in the query itself. So when you pass in, let's say, ID 1234, you get back that exact object. Um, the resolvers picks up this ID using context body variables, like this. So now let's look at the different ways of managing state with GraphQL and React. 
there's a lot of different ways we can manage state currently. So there's a native React component state, context API, Redux, which is the most popular one, Mobix, uh, Mobix state tree, hooks, and Apollo client. I'm going to be talking about Redux and hooks today. So let's look at Redux. How many of you have used Redux? Awesome, most of you. Cool. So I'll do a quick recap of Redux. Um, as you know, Redux has three concepts, store, action, reducer. Store is an object that stores all the data. This is a state management. Action tells uh, store what uh, to update. And reducer says how to update that, uh, the state. So let's say this is the same application. We have the store. We want to get the profile. We'll dispatch an action, get profile. The action goes to the store. The store picks it up and then calls an API which in fact uh, the reducer picks up the action, calls the API within itself, and then when the data comes back, we might have to normalize that data because it's probably not in the format that we need. And then the store updates and uh, sends an action done fetching, store updates, and the UI re-renders, and now we have the name of the user. This is how the Redux works in a snapshot. Now, the advantages of Redux and why it is popular is because it has the concept of a single source of truth. State is, sta store is the place where all of your data sits, and everybody has access to it. And we know exactly what that data might look like at any point of time. So it is very predictable, and it has a huge ecosystem behind it. But there's a lot of challenges of Redux as well, and especially in my application, I found that it has a huge boilerplate. Just to send like a get profile, I had to set up five different files, and there was a lot of code I had to write for just doing one action. And it, it, it's very strong on immutability, but that's up to the developer to implement it. So now let's look at hooks. Uh, how many of you are using hooks? Cool, awesome. Um, so Hooks was actually proposed in October 2018, and it's already very popular, and a lot of you are already using it. It was released four months later. Uh, it's now available in React 16.8, and it's super popular. I'm super in love with it. The biggest selling point of React Hooks is, is that it lets you use state without having a class component. So what you had to do before was, let's say you have a functional component. Um, let's say you are just using a presentational component. You just want to display the name of the user. And now, let's say if you want to update or, or if you want to start using state, let's say if the user's name is whatever, you want to change the state of the, of the application, you would have to convert your functional component to a class component. But now with the addition of hooks in 16.8, it lets you do that automatically right out of the box without having to convert your functional component to a class component. One caveat is that hooks can only be used in a functional component. So today I'm going to talk about four uh, major hooks, uh, use effect, use reducer, use context, and use state. Uh, so let's first talk about use state. Uh, this is similar to this dot state in class components. It is used for updating the state, getting data from the state. Uh, it's the similar. It's equivalent to set state in classful components, uh, and it is used to initialize state and auto update the state. So this is how it works. Uh, this is from the documentation. So let's say use state is basically a function. You can pass in whatever data you want. Let's say you pass in a constant of zero. It initializes, it spits out two variables. One is the state variable, and the other one is a setter function. So let's say you want to initialize your state with zero of count. So you pass in count, set count, you pass in zero, and then it updates count with zero. And if you want to use it, you simply do set count, or you can you, you clicked count times. Simple setter. Here's a slightly advanced example. So as I said, you can pass in whatever you want to use state. So you can also pass in objects. You pass in a list of three items, um, and then it gives you back to-dos and set to-dos to build a to-do application. And then to use it, it's super simple. Just you iterate over to-dos variable. The cool thing that I liked about hooks is that you can use multiple hooks together. So you can use two different use state. You can use use effect, use state, any hooks together. And you can also make custom hooks together. Now let's look at use effect. Um, use effect is the hook that is used to call any side effects, such as updating the DOM, calling an API, subscribing to uh, subscriptions. Um, and it adds a function. It, ac it accepts a function with effectful code. Effectful code is a code that does any side effects. And it is similar to component did mount in a classful component. Let's look at it in detail. 
So you have a use effect, it accepts of, uh, an effectful code, as I said, so you might have something like, you want to update the DOM, so what you can do is simply pass in document.title uh, to pass in, uh, to update the DOM, and once the component renders, React picks up any hooks after the render is complete, uh, sorry, React picks up any use effect hooks after the render is complete, so it has painted the page and now you're telling uh, React to pick up document.title and update it to the count. Here's another example. So this is used to, uh, this is uh, showing how to do subscriptions. So again, you're passing in a function handle status change and you're subscribing in this use effect, a use effect hook. Uh, so you're going to pass in the handle status change to the function and subscribe to the friend ID. Uh, one of the cool things about this is that you can pass in a return function and that can, that can be used to do a cleanup. So use effect can do both functions of use component did mount and will unmount. So it's super handy. Uh, the next two hooks, so we just talked about use effect and use state, and I'm going to talk about two different hooks, use reducer and use context. I think a lot of you would be familiar with these two uh, concepts at least. So context, if, if you're familiar with context API, use context is uh, basically similar. So in context API, you have a provider at the top, you pass in some value, and then all the consumers or all the components can have access to that uh, data. So let's say in use context, we have the same concept. We pass in context at the top, and then any object or any component that wants to use that data can simply do, simply call the hook, use context, and pass in the context. One caveat, though, is that use context can only be used to read context, but you still have to use the provider method to pass in data at the top. And the next is the uh, use reducer. It works exactly like how Redux uh, reducers work. The only additional thing is that in, in addition to dispatch, it also gives a state variable. So when you call use reducer with your reducer, and uh, it gives you back not only dispatch, but it also gives you back the state. So the four different hooks that we're going to be using to update our state management for GraphQL is use effect, use reducer, use context, and use state. Uh, now I'm going to demo a application, and I have put the URL here if you want to follow along. I'll give you a minute to open it up. Is it clear? Can you guys see? Cool. All right. So um, this is a this is my version of Google Play Music. So basically, this uh, application has a form at the top, and it has a list of the songs that I have in my uh, UI. Let me just minimize it. Uh, so it's super simple. Let's say we want to add a song. Um, I'm going to add a song that I really love. And then all I'm going to do is click on the Add Song button. It fires up a mutation and sends the first song right here at the bottom. Uh, so simple UI application, nothing fancy, does a query for the list of uh, songs, has a mutation component for adding a new song, and whatever gets added gets updated here. Okay. So I'm going to show you what hooks I've used here, the four hooks that I described, and how to use them. Uh, so let's, how's the font? Okay, cool. Uh, so let's start with the home component, which is the first component that loads. Um, in this component, the first thing that gets fired up is the GraphQL query. In this query, I'm asking for the actor or the artist, the name of the song, and the lyrics of the song. One of the good things about GraphQL and React is that 
whatever data you need, you have it right there in the component that you're asking it for. So the data sits and the query sits in the same component. It's very easy to debug and very easy to know what data you're asking, so you're avoiding overfetching. Okay, so I've called a query with, uh, I've called a GraphQL query with actor or the artist name and lyrics. Now the first thing that happens is that when this component loads, the query gets fired. That's how I get the data, the songs. I have the songs hooked up here. Now what I'm going to do is, once the component has loaded, I'm going to use the use effect hook to fire up an action or dispatch an action, add content with the payload of the songs. This is the data that I just fetched. And at the same time, I'm telling React that, hey, update my state or update my component only when songs updates. And that's why I'm passing in songs as a variable here. So now I've used use effect to, uh, to show data on the page. The next thing is I want, to, I want to show or I want to know and update the data and the state all over in the application. So I'm going to use use context here. And I've set it up in index.js. Right here. So let's say that, now I said that GraphQL gives you the power to ask for exactly what you need. Let's say I don't need uh, lyrics anymore. So what I'm going to do is just remove lyrics from the query that I fired and remove it from here. So once I've updated my query, my data doesn't show anymore. So even if I don't know the lyrics, that's fine. So let me show you the four hooks that I've used. There's use effect to dispatch an action, use context to update the state globally, and then I'm firing dispatch actions from use reducer to add content. And then I'll use state wherever I need to have local state. So that's how you use four different hooks to manage state in a GraphQL application. Okay, so to recap, first of all, initialize your state at the very top component, then call use reducer with the initial state. Figure out which top level components should have context and set up context. Then pass in the dispatch to the use reducer. And then hook up GraphQL API in use effect. Use use context in use reducer to receive and update the global state and, pass it and dispatch actions whenever you need to. And then use use state for updating local state whenever you need to. So what we found out is that with the help of hooks natively from React, we don't even need an additional library for managing state. We don't even need Redux. We don't need anything, even Apollo client. And one of the things that we notice is don't over-engineer your state management solution. Think about like what data you're getting. What is the data that you're getting from your APIs? How many network calls are you making? Can you even leverage the network? Do you even need a state management solution? Can you ne leverage uh, native, native uh, state? So now here are the decisions that you, the, here are the questions you can ask yourself that, to make the decision of which state management library to use. The first is ask yourself, how expensive are the network calls? What is the data that you're getting back? Um, how many network calls are you making? Do you have control over APIs? Can you mock your REST API into a GraphQL API to ask for exactly what you need? How important is offline usage? One of the biggest advantages of Redux is that it has extremely well um, offline usage um, uh, applications. So if you, want, uh, if you want offline usage, Redux is probably a good, um, good option. And then how complex is your state? Um, I noticed React Hooks was really helpful in the form components I was using, but think about how complex is your application state. So the lessons that we learned was when using GraphQL, you may not need a state management solution in, on top of what React natively provides, and usually React state or context is enough for passing data uh, around the application. That's all I have for you today. If you want to know, the, if you want to look at the code again. Uh, you can go to GitHub, uh, Hooks, GraphQL, and my repo. Thank you very much. This video recording was brought to you by Twilio.
We allow you to integrate different means of communication such as video, chat, or SMS into your React applications. If you want to learn how you can send SMS directly from a React chat, check out this video on the right or go to our Twilio YouTube channel. And if you want to watch another React India talk, we picked one out just for you over here on the left. Thanks for watching.